Schultz. I'm currently serving as the director of the policy planning staff uh, in the U.S. Department of State. I'm on leave from the Hoover Institution, where I'm a senior fellow. And I've had the honor, in addition over this past year, to serve as the executive secretary of the State Department's Commission on Unalienable Rights. Uh, one of uh, Secretary Pompeo's great decisions in standing up the commission, uh, in my judgment, was to name Marianne Glendon chair of the commission. Uh, Marianne is a uh, distinguished professor of law at Harvard Law School. She's written on a great variety of topics, not least on uh, rights, uh, and has produced a wonderful book, uh, World Made New, about uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and um, and the, uh, her great efforts to secure approval in the UN General Assembly of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it is great to be in conversation with you, Marianne. This is the first time we've spoken, Peter, since the final version of our report was posted. Yeah. And I'm very grateful to the Vandenberg Group and to First Things for um, allowing us to say a few words about the mandate that we received, because it's my impression, I don't know whether you have the same impression, but it's my impression that there's a good deal of misunderstanding about the scope and limits of the task that we were asked to do. If you just think about the title of our commission, it sounds very broad, Commission yes. on Unalienable Rights. And I remember a year ago when the commission was first announced, one of my colleagues at Harvard who is uh, an expert on human rights and uh, very much part of the human rights establishment. He said, so you're going to be jiggering with the concept of human <laughs> rights. And uh, certainly one might have had that idea from the title, but the fact is, as uh, we both know, we had a charter. And yes. the charter, uh, the description of the duties of the commission is, if, from one point of view, it looks very broad to advise the State Department on the role of human rights in foreign policy. But it's considerably narrowed by one of the stipulations, which is that we were to uh, avoid venturing into the area of policy making. And uh, the distinction is hard to draw, we yes. must admit, between principle and policy. But I think it would be worthwhile discussing that a bit after having worked on trying to unpack what that might mean. It, it seems to me that uh, many of the people who read the report and commented on it did not understand that we were not to venture into the area of policy making. Yes, I, uh, I, I think that's right. And one of, to me, one of the more entertaining mistakes um, and I heard it a lot, um, was that it went something like this. On July 16th, when the Secretary of State gave that uh, wonderful speech in Philadelphia, introducing the report to the public, uh, is it true that he said, as the uh, report proclaims, that American foreign policy should revolve around promoting uh, property rights and religious liberty? And uh, I have uh, I received this uh, question actually from staffers in Congress and elsewhere. And I said, well, no, that's an inaccurate uh, statement of the secretary's view and of what the report said. I think you're referring to a passage in the report in which we observe that at the time of the founding, uh, it, it was thought that among the unalienable rights, are, that is rights that inherit in all persons. Among those are certain fundamental property rights and religious liberty. And it was part of our mandate to uh, explain what the, uh, what the constitutional view was, what the view was in the Declaration of Independence. But we published a long report explaining how those views uh, develop, how our understanding of those fundamental rights develops over the course of America's more than two century uh, history. Yes, I think uh, what was remarkable about that instruction to stay at the level of principle is 
uh, it's quite remarkable when you consider that most people think about foreign policy as a matter purely of power and interest. Here we have a, a Secretary of the United States um, doing something quite remarkable. He wants to make sure that our foreign policy is principled. Mm -hmm. And the role of principle is to help guide policy making. So uh, I, I hope we have cleared that up a bit. Uh, it, it is true that um, it wasn't hard for the commission. I think uh, you'd agree with this, Peter. It wasn't, it, it, it wasn't hard for the commission to understand the words, but to apply them and to actually draw that line between yes. principle and policy. It, it was not easy. But I think uh, an, another comment that is often made uh, by uh, readers of the report is um, it's rather critical of us for not dealing with the burning issues of the day. Yes. And I think actually uh, a careful reader of the report, and it's a 60 page report, so we can't yes. ask for too much, but a careful reader of the report would see what the secretary was getting at, that principle is to guide policy. And actually, if you look at it that way, we do address the burning issues of the day in the sense that we offer uh, very detailed guidelines for distinguishing what ought to be considered a fundamental right and what is merely the assertion of a right claim. We offer several guidelines on that, which are directly relevant to the burnish, burning issues of the day. So I, I, in a moment, I'd like to, uh, to return to this question of the of legitimate pluralism, which is a, a concept that we, we examine. But I do want to uh, stay for the moment, as I say, on, on the level of principle. Um, I, I didn't mean in the slightest, of course, to disparage the centrality of property rights or religious liberty in the American tradition, just of course to illustrate um, the confusion that can arise between describing the origins of our tradition and fundamental principles and difficult policy questions. And I think it's also fair to say that um, many, maybe even mo all of the commissioners, certainly the report itself, orients itself around, is oriented around um, a number of important statements that Abraham Lincoln makes. Well, one of them is this, he congratulates Jefferson and the other uh, 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 signers of the Declaration of Independence for, I think, I think he says, introducing into a merely revolutionary doctrine, a universal truth applicable to all men and all times. Um, Lincoln understood uh, the tremendous significance for politics of uh, getting your principles right and the dedication to them. And so just as it was uh, in light of uh, the, the principles set forth in the Declaration of Independence, that one, the United States created a free and democratic government and then found a way to uh, eradicate slavery, so to today, in light of abstract principles, dedication to freedom, equality, human dignity, the United States is much better able to uh, carry on the debates about, uh, about precise policies. Yes, and what you're describing here is the first part of one of the stipulations that uh, we were given, that we were to ground our advice to the State Department in the distinctive rights tradition of the United States. And uh, who could have imagined a year ago when we started to work on that, that this, uh, the uh, point and purpose of the rights tradition of the United States would become such a subject of controversy. But I think we started out well by describing our tradition as both distinctive and dynamic. It really is unique in the world, and it's, a, it's an amalgam of several traditions, uh, but it is also dynamic in the sense that it is a constantly evolving tradition. It's a tradition that is constituted 
by a discussion that goes on at this very moment about what, who we are as a people, where we came from, what is the meaning of our origins, where are we now, and where would we like to go? And uh, I think that the whole first part of our report is, uh, I hope, will be regarded as a very serious contribution to the discussion that is currently taking place in the United States. Yes, I, I think that's I think that's right. I want to emphasize, as we do in the report, that uh, the the American tradition, distinctive and dynamic, has a variety of sources. Variety of sources feed into it. As we point out in the report, there's the biblical tradition that was so important uh, to the to the generation of the American founders. And what we identify from that tradition is the beautiful teaching that all human beings, the Bible couldn't be clear, man and woman, all human beings are created in the image of God. That means endowed with a certain fundamental dignity, deserving of a certain respect, but also bearing certain responsibilities. A second tradition was the civic Republican tradition, uh, a, a tradition from classical political philosophy that focuses on uh, the responsibilities of citizens in maintaining a free society. And the third tradition, of course, is uh, we could call it the modern tradition of freedom, the tradition of uh, John Locke and many others that says politics begins with the recognition that all human beings are by nature free and equal, and that the purpose of government is to secure, to secure rights. Now, as you know, uh, as we both know all too well, Another criticism of the Commission's work is that we actually played into the hands of the Russians and the Chinese by focusing on American traditions to derive support for America for the commitments that the United States took on in 1948. Um, but there's an excellent reply to that, and I must say, uh, I learned about this reply from, from a document, Marianne, that you, uh, to which you directed all of the commissioners at the very beginning, a document that was produced in 1947 and 1948 by UNESCO that involved bringing together um, uh, 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 philosophers from, from all over the world to discuss, uh, discuss the foundations of human rights. That is, a question arose. I'm sorry, I'm getting a screen. Can you hear me, Marianne? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Ah, okay. Well, I, well I'll nevertheless uh, continue, although I'm sorry to have lost your, your face as well. The, um, as you know, the purpose of this, uh, the symposium convened by uh, UNESCO was to ask the question, how can nations and peoples different nations and different peoples agree on human rights? And the answer was more or less, uh, nations and peoples of the world can agree on a small number of concrete principles, but it is to be expected that they will reason to these uh, small number of concrete principles, uh, the ones ultimately that appeared in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they will it is to be expected they will reason to them from within their own traditions and find within their own traditions resor resources, moral resources, philosophical resources, religious resources. So uh, we hope, uh, I think, that um, another, uh, another benefit of the report is that it provides an example of how one nation turning to its own traditions find support for universal commitments to human rights and serves as a kind of invitation to um, other nations and other peoples more than 70 years after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, to, to renew, renew their commitments by turning to their, um, to their traditions and their moral, philosophical, and religious resources. Yes, I, I would only add to that that uh, there is uh, a very good answer to the uh, mistaken observation that we were in any way giving aid and comfort to those notorious human rights violating countries that uh, want to promote certain versions of human rights at the expense of others 
and that in fact have started to attack the very foundations of the post-World War II human rights project? And the answer is, uh, the answer to what we must admit is a difficult question. How do you put together the idea that all human rights must be protected with the admonition that the particular national and cultural uh, characteristics have to be borne in mind. That's the Vienna Declaration of 1993. How do you put those two things together? Well, the answer is that there are certain limits on the degree to which national particularities can be advanced at the expense of fundamental human rights. And those limits are inherent in the Universal Declaration itself, and they are inherent in international law, which tells us in countless ways and places that certain rights are non-derogable. And in the principle that fundamental human rights, that small core of rights that the nations agreed upon, that those fundamental rights are interdependent. That means that it's a, it's a violation of one's international obligations to advance one right, much not to mention a claim of right, but to advance one right and totally subordinate the others. There will always be a tension between freedom and equality, and different societies will adjust that in the ways that seem suitable to them, but they can't entirely submerge freedom to equality, and they can't entirely submerge equality to freedom. Yes, I, I think that's right, and it, and it strikes me, um, reflecting on what you've just said, that um, one of the contributions of our report is to, is to bring out that human rights, especially from the point of view of the American constitutional tradition, are on the one hand central, essential, and on the other hand, um, there are limits to human rights and there are excesses and abuses to, to which they're exposed. And in a way, we bring this out in two respects. One, uh, you were just describing, we offer a careful reading of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We show that this was not a document that was just slapped together. It has an internal structure. Uh, and logic, and that internal structure and logic help us understand the sense in which rights, uh, human rights, are to be understood as universal, indivisible, interrelated, and inter interdependent. But there's another respect in which we um, bring out both the essential character of human rights and, and the complexity of living in accordance with them, and that is through the, the history we tell of the American struggle with human rights. For us, um, in part one of our report, uh, it, it begins on, yes, on the level of principle. We give an account of the Declaration of Independence, of how the uh, Constitution um, uh, w was designed in order to most effectively defend rights. But we also give an account of how the United States has struggled for its two centuries to understand ever more accurately and effectively what the commitment to unalienable rights, the rights that are inherent in all persons, what that means as a political matter and how to enact it in law, in public policy, and for that matter, in our daily conduct as citizens. So I think both the historical account of one nation struggling with human rights and I must uh, say, achieving a great deal and making uh, 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 admirable progress, but also the, the account, which I think is unusual, of, um, uh, of the structure of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is, is we hope, uh, of assistance not only to policymakers, but to citizens, men and women around the world, as, who, in, if you're living, if you have the good fortune to live in a democracy, then you will have to vote and make political decisions about be how best to live up to rights. And if you don't have the good fortune to live in a democracy, then you'll have the chance to uh, hope be, be inspired 
by uh, how liberal democracies protect rights. And if you don't mind, Marianne, I, I should throw in this while we still have a moment, that um, as an illustration of the commission's interest in communicating not only with fellow citizens, but with people around the world, the commission has uh, commissioned the translation of our report into a variety of foreign languages, including Chinese, Russian, Farsi, Arabic, Hindi, Spanish, and French, with, with more to come. Uh, we hope this will launch a, a conversation not only within the United States, but beyond our borders. I'm glad you mentioned that, Peter, because uh, I think that our uh, European listeners today will appreciate something that uh, the secretary said in one of his spe speeches about the report. He said that he hoped it would strengthen the intellectual defense of the post-World War II human rights project. And one of the things we all discovered as we pursued our work over the past year is how much has been forgotten or perhaps never even apprehended well over the past 70 years about the Human Rights Project. And the, it, I think we have been able to refresh the understanding of the principles that all nations agreed to after two horrible world wars. They said, here are some few things, not very many. It's got 30 articles, but it hasn't got 30 rights. It's a small core <laughs> of rights. And uh, to, to uh, have that present for the discussion that we hope will take place everywhere, uh, I think is, and I hope is, one of the main contributions of the work that we did over the past year. Uh, and th there's another, along those lines, Marianne, there's another point to emphasize, which we do emphasize throughout the report, and it became especially apparent to us because of uh, the convulsions that shook the United States as our, as our report was, um, uh, was being prepared for publication. And, and, and that's this. Um, there is the most fundamental difference between a liberal democracy that is grounded in a commitment to the rights of all human beings and other, other political regimes which repudiate the idea that there are certain rights inherent in all uh, persons that all regimes must protect. All liberal democracies fall short and indeed there will always be, as, as we suggest in the report, um, legitimate and serious disputes among regimes about how best to honor religious freedom, freedom of speech, um, a certain standard of living for, for all human beings. Those debates are, um, are perennial, but, we, but really a world of difference between countries that understand that those debates are at the center, center of politics because at the center of politics is protecting what all human beings share, that inherent dignity, and other kinds of regimes, autocratic regimes, which reject that, um, uh, that f equality and freedom that is the foundation of liberal democracies. That's right. It's, it's something that we should not forget, that there is no moral equivalence between liberal democracies that have terrible failings but have the mechanisms and the will to overcome them and learn from them, and countries where the opportunities that we take for granted, free speech, free press, free elections, are not available. And, and as we point out, this is not just a view that, we, that we've come to, this was a view that we, uh, that we report, we found in uh, former slave Frederick Douglass, which Abraham Lincoln uh, articulated, which uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony recognized when they were fighting for the right to vote for uh, women, and which Martin Luther King so eloquently championed when he was uh, fighting for, for human rights and for civil rights. Well, it's uh, a great encouragement for us, and I'm sure here Peter and I are speaking for all the members of our commission. It's a great encouragement to know that uh, there is interest in the report and in the issues that we raise, the issues that we discuss. And we're very grateful to the Vandenberg Foundation and to First Things for making this conversation possible. 
Uh, that is entirely true. And I, and I want to express my, uh, take this opportunity to express my gratitude to, to the chair of the commission, without whom uh, s such a report uh, could certainly not have been produced. So many thanks to you, Marianne, for your wonderful leadership. Well, this report was truly the product of 11 minds and 11, Indeed. I might add, 11 very diverse minds with different views about many things, but unanimity on the importance of the fundamental human rights that belong to every single human being. Yes.